Shadows of Legacy, written by ChatGPT. Read by AI-generated voice of Detlef Bierstedt, using 11 Labs TTS and RVC Beta for the voice. Chapter 1. The Enigmatic Hint The city was a mosaic of light and shadows, and in a dark alley distant from the bright streets lay a body, motionless and cold. The night silence was broken only by the distant sound of sirens and the muffled murmurs of the first onlookers brave enough to approach the scene. Mason Paul stepped carefully over the tape and approached the body. It was a middle-aged man, dressed finely as if he had been coming from or going to a place of significance. Clutched in his hand was a crumpled newspaper, as if it was his last connection to the living world. A young police officer whom Mason had never seen before approached him nervously. Detective Paul, the scene's been secured. The guy over there found him, says he saw a brief movement in the alley and then... Well, him. Mason nodded in acknowledgement. He stepped closer and examined the deceased. The way he lay seemed oddly arranged, as if his last moment had been a peaceful one. This didn't match what Mason knew about murders. There was usually chaos and struggle. With gloved hands, he took the newspaper from the dead man's grip and unfolded it. Most of the articles were mundane. Sports results, local news, advertisements for the upcoming town fair. However, a comment in the opinion section drew his attention. Not the content of the comment itself, but the manner it was written, in the form of a riddle. Every ending has a start, every loss a gain in part. Look where the light starts to dim, and you'll find the next clue within the maze's rim. Mason furrowed his brow. This comment seemed out of place. It was as if it had been deliberately placed there to be found, an encrypted hint. But for what? Who was this man? Mason's question was more to himself than to the young officer, who was now reading the riddle with widened eyes. Before he could respond, a middle-aged woman with short curly hair and a camera around her neck approached. She was Isabel, a reporter from the local newspaper often found at such scenes. Mason, did you see this? She pointed to the riddle. He nodded. Yes, but I can't say yet if it's connected to the murder. It's unusual. I'll give you that. Isabel pulled out a small notebook. I noticed this comment a few days ago in the editorial room. It was sent anonymously, and I thought it was just a prank. Mason eyed her sharply. Have you received more comments like this? She pondered for a moment. Maybe. I'd have to check. But how does this relate to the murder? Mason wasn't sure yet, but his instincts told him this riddle and the murder were intertwined. He would need to delve deeper to find answers, and he would do so with the help of old friends and new allies joining him on this mysterious journey. The ambient light from the street lamps cast an eerie glow on the scene. Mason's mind was working furiously. Years of solving intricate cases had sharpened his intuition, and right now it was flashing warning signals. Suddenly, a voice broke through his thoughts. Mason! It was Oliver, one of Mason's old colleagues from the precinct. The two had shared countless hours chasing suspects and piecing together clues. They were more than just co-workers. They were friends. Glad you're here, Mason muttered, showing Oliver the mysterious comment. It might be nothing, but it's intriguing. Oliver studied the riddle for a moment, then glanced around the alleyway. Where the light starts to dim, he murmured, looking at the space where the street lights faded and the alley's darkness began. At the edge, there was a graffitied symbol of a maze on the brick wall. Not random street art, it was too precise, too detailed. Mason approached the wall, searching for anything out of the ordinary. To a regular passerby, it was just another graffiti image. But for someone like Mason, the pattern stood out. Within the intricate turns of the maze, there was a tiny symbol, an eye. 
he pulled out a notepad and began to sketch the graffiti, paying special attention to the I symbol. This might be our next lead, Ollie. Oliver nodded, looking over Mason's shoulder as he sketched. We're dealing with someone who wants us to follow a trail. The real question is, where does it lead? As they mulled over the mystery, Isabel walked over with her camera in tow. You two seem awfully engrossed in that drawing. Care to share? Mason showed her the graffiti image with the embedded eye symbol. Do you recognize this? You've been around town more than most. She pondered for a moment. I've seen this symbol before, but not here. There's a building in the old part of town, used to be a library or something. I've seen the symbol on its door. Oliver's eyes widened in realization. The old Cartwright building. I remember now. That place was rumored to be a hotspot for secret societies in the twenties. Mason's thoughts raced. A possible secret society, a murder, and a cryptic message. The night was just beginning. Suddenly, a soft beeping sound emanated from the victim's pocket. Mason, wearing gloves, reached in and pulled out a phone. There was an incoming message. Did you deliver the message? Chills ran down Mason's spine. The game was more complex than he'd imagined. He pocketed the phone discreetly. This could be their direct line to whoever was behind this. We need to go to the Cartwright building, Mason declared. But first, let's ensure this scene is properly documented. No detail is too small. As the team scurried to cover all bases, Mason couldn't shake off a lingering feeling. This wasn't just a murder. It was a message, a challenge directly aimed at him. And he was more than ready to accept it. Chapter 2 Shadows of the Past The Cartwright Building, situated on Linton Street in the old part of the city, was an imposing stone structure with intricate carvings and vast windows. Once a bustling hub of knowledge and enlightenment, it had been long forgotten, replaced by modern libraries and institutions. It stood silent and brooding, almost mourning its grander days. Mason's car pulled up outside the dilapidated building, its headlights piercing through the darkness and briefly illuminating the old entrance. The very same symbol from the alley graffiti was etched into the wooden door. Oliver let out a low whistle. This place gives me the creeps. Are you sure our clues point here? Before Mason could answer, Isabel spoke up. It matches the description. And that symbol is hard to ignore. I have a feeling we'll find more inside, Mason murmured, his detective instincts tingling. As they approached the entrance, Mason felt an uneasiness. This wasn't just about decoding a message, it was about uncovering a story buried deep within the city's bones. The main hall was vast, with a cracked marble floor and tall, dusty shelves filled with old books. Moonlight streamed in from the broken windows, casting shadows that seemed to dance with the building's memories. Let's split up. Search for any more of those symbols or anything that stands out, Mason instructed, pulling out a flashlight. As they delved deeper, each corner of the building revealed its secrets. Oliver found old photos of well-dressed men and women, perhaps once influential members of society. Isabel stumbled upon journals and letters detailing meetings, coded messages and rituals. Mason, however, was drawn to a dimly lit room at the end of a corridor. The room was lined with old paintings, but one in particular caught his attention. It depicted a grand party with elegantly dressed people, and at the center was a man with strikingly familiar features, someone who bore an uncanny resemblance to Mason himself. He quickly checked the details on the painting's plaque. It read, Lord Henry Paul, 1921. Lord Henry Paul, Mason whispered to himself, the same last name. Is this a coincidence? As he pondered, he felt a hand on his shoulder. Isabel stood behind him, her face pale. Look at this, she whispered, handing Mason an old journal she had found. 
he quickly skimmed through its pages and was drawn to an entry dated November 12, 1921. The society grows restless. Lord Henry Paul, once our staunchest supporter, has become our most vocal critic. He knows too much and must be silenced. Oliver joined them, holding a tarnished locket. Inside was a faded photo of a woman. Written on the back was, Eleanor, forever yours, H.P. Mason's mind raced, a mysterious society, his potential ancestor, and a plot from nearly a century ago. Were the past and present intertwining in some cryptic dance? Oliver broke the silence. This society, whoever they were, seemed powerful and influential, and if Lord Henry Paul was opposing them, they might have had him killed, Isabel finished. Mason nodded. And if this society has somehow continued to the present day, they might be involved in our current case. The pieces were starting to fit, but the overall picture remained blurry. The trio knew they had to dig deeper into the annals of history and confront whatever modern iteration of the society existed. As they exited the Cartwright building, the weight of their findings heavy on their minds, Mason's phone buzzed. It was an unknown number. You're getting closer, but are you ready to face the truth? The game was afoot. Under the haunting glow of streetlights, the trio stood silent outside the Cartwright building, processing the mysterious message. Mason's fingers tightened around his phone. Our moves are being watched, he muttered. Isabel shifted uneasily, her eyes darting around the deserted street. Whoever is behind this is always one step ahead. Oliver frowned, his earlier enthusiasm replaced with a hint of concern. The deeper we go, the more dangerous this becomes. We're not just dealing with a simple crime, are we? Mason shook his head. No, it's more convoluted. Lord Henry Paul, the society, the recent murder, it's all linked. We're not just solving a murder, we're uncovering a history intertwined with secrets and vendettas. Isabel took a deep breath, trying to find some semblance of calm. We need to gather more information. Historical records, maybe talk to some of the old families in town. Someone must know about this society and their motives. The trio agreed to regroup the next morning. But as Mason headed to his car, he felt an odd sensation, like being watched. He turned to look down an adjacent alleyway. In the fleeting moment, he thought he saw a shadowed figure retreating into the darkness. The same symbol from the Cartwright building was hastily graffitied on the alley's wall. Reaching his apartment, Mason locked the door and took a moment to breathe. The living room was dimly lit, the only light coming from the city outside filtering through the blinds. But something was amiss. On his coffee table lay an old photograph, an image of Lord Henry Paul, the woman from the locket, and a group of well-dressed individuals all standing in front of the Cartwright building. Below the photograph was a note. A legacy isn't always a gift. Be careful, Detective Paul. Every fiber of Mason's being screamed that he was in over his head, but the curious and righteous side of him, the side that had made him an excellent detective, pushed him forward. This wasn't just about solving a case anymore. It was personal. Throughout the night, Mason combed through old family records, trying to discern any links to Lord Henry Paul. An old, tattered diary from his grandfather provided a sliver of clarity. It spoke of a family disgrace, a betrayal that led to a downfall. There were whispers of an oath and a blood promise. The specifics were vague, but the message was clear. The Paul family had once been embroiled in something much larger than Mason could have ever imagined. As dawn broke, a plan formed in Mason's mind. He would confront this head-on, drawing from the strength of his ancestors. Whatever secrets lay buried in the past, it was high time they were brought to light. Chapter 3 
whispers in the archives. As the first rays of sunlight crept into the city, casting long shadows over the cobbled streets, Mason arrived at the city's historical society. The ancient stone building, with its ornate carvings and moss-covered facade, had stood for centuries as a testament to the city's rich history. Inside, the quiet, musty air was punctuated by the ticking of a grandfather clock, long rows of shelves filled with books, records and ancient manuscripts filled the large room. Mason approached the counter where an elderly lady, Mrs. Grafton, the chief archivist, was diligently sorting through some papers. Ah, Detective Paul, she greeted, her eyes sharp behind thick glasses. What brings you here so early? Mason explained his need to delve into the history of Lord Henry Paul and any records concerning the old society or the symbol he'd discovered. Mrs. Grafton's eyes dimmed with a mix of curiosity and concern. Come with me, she beckoned, leading him to a secluded section of the archives. There, she produced a leather-bound book, its cover worn and pages yellowed with age. This is a record of the city's elite from a century ago. Lord Henry Paul, your ancestor, was a prominent figure, but his name was expunged from many records. It said he was involved in a secret society that wielded great power. Flipping through the pages, Mason found an old photograph. It depicted Lord Henry Paul and several other distinguished-looking men, each wearing a ring with the same cryptic symbol. Among the names listed, one caught his eye. Cartwright. Reading aloud, Mason discovered the two families, Paul and Cartwright, were founders of the secret society, but a disagreement led to a fallout, resulting in a deadly feud. The society disbanded, and members took an oath of secrecy. Those who broke it paid with their lives. As Mason delved deeper, Mrs. Grafton recounted an old legend. It said that Lord Henry Paul was betrayed by a close friend from the Cartwright family. This led to his ruin. The society had a treasure, an artifact of great power. Lord Henry tried to protect it, but it was stolen, and its location remains a mystery. A shiver ran down Mason's spine. The stakes were much higher than he'd realized. It wasn't just a murder. It was the reopening of old wounds, a battle between two families, and a hunt for a legendary artifact. Feeling the weight of his family's legacy, Mason thanked Mrs. Grafton and headed to meet Isabel and Oliver. As he left the historical society, he noticed the same shadowy figure from the previous night, watching him from a distance. With a renewed sense of purpose, Mason knew he had to uncover the secrets of the past to protect the future. The next step was to confront the Cartwrights, hoping to uncover more about the society and its enigmatic treasure. Determined to unravel the story further, Mason decided his next step should be to revisit the crime scene at Lord Henry's Manor, bearing the newfound information in mind. He sensed that the answers he sought were hidden in plain sight. The manor loomed large as Mason approached, its imposing facade telling tales of a bygone era. He headed straight to the study, the heart of the mystery. The room was still cordoned off, the chalk outline a grim reminder of Victor's tragic end. With a heightened sense of awareness, Mason examined the study with fresh eyes. On the grand wooden desk, amidst the scattered papers and mighting instruments, he discovered a small, worn journal bearing the Paul family crest. Flipping it open, he began to read entries penned by Lord Henry himself. July 14th, 1889. The artifact has brought nothing but sorrow. I fear its power and the lengths to which some will go to possess it. I must protect it, even from those closest to me. As Mason delved deeper into the journal, entries became increasingly paranoid and cryptic. Lord Henry wrote of secret meetings, coded messages, and trusted allies turning to foes. October 23, 1889 the Cartwrights grow suspicious. I've taken precautions, hiding the artifact where only a true Paul can find it. 
Should it fall into the wrong hands, the consequences are unimaginable. Mason's heart raced. The artifact was hidden within the manor itself. Spotting a detailed sketch of the manor's blueprints in the journal, Mason traced his fingers over it, searching for any indication of a hidden chamber or compartment. A peculiar marking near the library caught his attention. A concealed doorway, perhaps. Without wasting a moment, he rushed to the library. Rows of books towered high, and the room smelled of leather and old paper. Mason began scanning the shelves, searching for any sign of the hidden entrance. Feeling along the intricately carved wooden panels, he stumbled upon a small indentation, a replica of the mysterious symbol. Pressing it gently, Mason heard a faint click, and a section of the bookshelf swung inward, revealing a dimly lit passage. Taking a deep breath, Mason stepped into the shadowy corridor, the weight of history pressing down on him. The passage led him to a small chamber. In its center stood a pedestal, and on it lay an ornate box crafted from gold and studded with precious gems. Mason approached cautiously and lifted the lid. Inside, cushioned on velvet, was a dazzling artifact, a crystal emitting a soft, ethereal glow but his moment of discovery was short-lived. From the shadows, the mysterious figure emerged, his face obscured by a mask. You shouldn't be here, detective, the figure warned, his voice cold. Mason squared his shoulders, ready to defend the artifact and the legacy of the Paul family. Chapter 4 The Masked Adversary the chamber's cold air grew tense as Mason and the masked figure sized each other up. Mason's detective instincts, sharpened by years of chasing the elusive truths hidden in human behavior, sensed the figure's apprehension, masked by bravado. Why are you after the artifact? Mason questioned, voice firm yet intrigued. The masked figure chuckled. It's not just a mere artifact, detective. It's power, history, and a legacy that has been misused. The response baffled Mason. Misused? By the Paul family? A momentary silence followed before the figure replied, not just them, generations of families who believed that possessing the artifact gave them dominion over others, but its power was meant to serve a greater purpose. Mason, gripping the artifact, retorted, Then what is its true purpose? Before the masked man could answer, a loud crashing noise echoed from the corridor. Both turned to see a group of men, bearing the insignia of the Cartwrights, storming the chamber. The leader of the group, a tall, imposing man with a scar across his cheek, sneered at Mason. Ah, detective, you've saved us the trouble of finding it. The odds were heavily against him. Mason realized that even if he managed to fend off one or two, he couldn't take them all down. But surrendering without a fight was not in his nature. Quickly assessing his surroundings, Mason hurled the artifact towards an open window at the chamber's far end. The masked figure, moving with surprising agility, intercepted it mid-air. The Cartwrights, momentarily distracted, gave Mason the split second he needed. He lunged at the nearest assailant, knocking him to the ground and creating a temporary barricade. You fool! Do you realize what you've done? The scar-faced man bellowed. But before he could react further, the room plunged into darkness. The masked figure had extinguished the lanterns. Chaos ensued. When light returned moments later, Mason, the masked figure, and the artifact had vanished. Back at his apartment, Mason panted heavily, adrenaline still coursing through his veins. The masked figure, unmasked now, was none other than Elias, his childhood friend and a distant cousin from a lesser-known branch of the Paul family. Elias spoke first. Mason, I know you have questions, but first, let's secure the artifact. Mason handed it over. Why the charade, Elias? Why not come to me directly? Elias sighed. I wanted to, but I didn't know whom to trust. The Cartwrights have infiltrated so many circles and their reach is vast. 
the artifact must be protected. Mason rubbed his temples, trying to piece together the puzzle. Start from the beginning. And so, Elias began the tale of the artifact's true origin and purpose, a story of power, betrayal, and the undying hope for a better world. The dim lighting in Mason's apartment accentuated the deep lines on Elias's face, marks that hadn't been there in their youth. Mason couldn't help but wonder what hardships his old friend had faced in his pursuit of the artifact. Elias carefully placed the artifact on the coffee table, its intricate design catching the little light in the room. It's older than you think, Mason. It dates back to ancient times when the Pauls and Cartwrights were one. It's said to hold unimaginable power, but the exact nature of its power is a secret that's been lost with time. Mason raised an eyebrow. If it's so powerful, why keep it a secret? Why not use it? Elias sighed, leaning back on the couch. Because with great power comes even greater responsibility. It's believed that the elders of both families knew its potential for misuse. They agreed to keep its existence a secret, and for generations it remained so. But the Cartwrights now? They've changed. Over the years, greed overtook their sense of responsibility. Their obsession with the artifact has caused many deaths, including, I suspect, that of Harold. Mason's thoughts immediately raced back to the night of the murder. You think the Cartwrights killed him? Elias nodded gravely. The Cartwrights have always believed that the artifact rightfully belonged to them. When they discovered its location, they wouldn't stop at anything to get their hands on it. Mason's hands clenched into fists. So, what do we do now? We protect it. We ensure it doesn't fall into the wrong hands. And Mason, you have to solve Harold's murder. The Cartwrights may be after the artifact, but they're also after anyone who stands in their way. A weight settled over Mason's shoulders, one he hadn't felt since the early days of his career. But there was also a clarity, a renewed sense of purpose. Elias got up to leave. You always had a knack for doing the right thing, even when it wasn't the easy thing. Mason nodded, determination set in his features. We'll bring them to justice, for Harold, for everyone they've hurt. As the door closed behind Elias, Mason sat in contemplation, feeling the weight of the artifact and the heavy responsibility that now rested with him. Chapter 5 Shadows in the Alley Mason decided that his first step would be to revisit Harold's office. There was a nagging feeling in the back of his mind that he had missed something. Dressed inconspicuously, he made his way to the Cartwright Enterprises building late at night. The janitor, an elderly man with graying hair, recognized Mason immediately. They had exchanged pleasantries during Mason's previous visits. Tonight, though, the man looked wary. Evening, Mr. Paul. A bit late for a visit, isn't it? I have a feeling the key to Harold's murder is in his office. Something I missed. The janitor sighed. I've seen things, Mr. Paul. Shadows moving, hushed conversations in the dark corners. I've kept my head down, but I'd advise caution. Thank you, Mason replied, a chill running down his spine. He had a feeling he was about to dive into dangerous territory. He made his way stealthily to Harold's office, the quiet of the night amplifying every sound. Mason used his lock-picking skills to gain entry, the soft click of the lock granting him access. Inside the room, Mason started with the desk, carefully examining each drawer. Old letters, faded photographs and general office supplies, but nothing out of the ordinary. Frustration began to creep in when he noticed a faint outline on the wooden surface of the desk. Curious, Mason pressed down, and with a soft click, a secret compartment slid open. Inside was a leather-bound journal, worn with age. Flipping through its pages, Mason realized it was Harold's personal diary. Entries described clandestine meetings, secret dealings, and hints of betrayal within the Cartwright family, but it was the last entry 
that caught Mason's attention. They're getting closer. I fear for my life. The artifact is not just history. It's a weapon, a dangerous tool they seek. If they find out I've hidden it, I'm done. I've entrusted it to Elias for safekeeping. Trusting Mason is a must. The Pauls and Cartwrights were never meant to be enemies. Suddenly, a noise outside the office door snapped Mason back to reality. He quickly replaced the journal, closed the secret compartment, and hid behind a large bookshelf just as the door creaked open. In the dim light, Mason could make out two silhouettes whispering to each other. Are you sure he was here? Yes, the janitor saw him. We can't let him find out about the artifact. We need to act fast. The figures left as abruptly as they came. Mason took a deep breath, realizing the gravity of the situation. Whoever these individuals were, they were deeply entrenched in the Cartwright's quest for the artifact and were likely involved in Harold's murder. Resolved, Mason knew he had to confront these shadows, but not tonight. Tonight, he had gained enough knowledge to build a plan. As dawn approached, he made his way back home, the weight of the situation pressing on him, but a burning determination in his heart. As Mason retreated from the Cartwright Enterprises building, he felt a sudden urge to visit the place he least expected, his own family's home. The mention of the Pauls in the journal intrigued him. The idea that the Pauls and Cartwrights were historically entangled was news to Mason. He drove to his childhood home, a grand old manor on the outskirts of the city. Mason had left the house in his teenage years, preferring the hustle and bustle of the city. The house had since been maintained by a caretaker, an elderly lady named Mrs. Bennett. Walking through the entrance brought a flood of memories. As a child, Mason had played in these very corridors, oblivious to the secrets they held. Mason recalled a family study, a place his parents had warned him away from, a room he had never been allowed to enter. Maybe now was the time. The massive oak door to the study was daunting, but Mason mustered the courage and turned the handle. Dust particles danced in the sunbeams streaming through the stained glass windows. The room was filled with artifacts, portraits, and shelves upon shelves of books. His eyes were drawn to a portrait of a man who bore an uncanny resemblance to him. The placard read, Arthur Paul. 1895. Beside Arthur stood another familiar face labeled George Cartwright. Intrigued, Mason began scouring through the documents on the desk. He found a letter yellowed with age. Dear Arthur, the artifact must be kept a secret. Our families must work together, for in the wrong hands it can bring great calamity. I trust you with its protection. Yours sincerely, George Cartwright. With growing realization, Mason understood that the enmity between the Pauls and Cartwrights was a recent construct. Their forefathers had once been allies, trusted friends. A rustling sound interrupted his thoughts. Mrs. Bennett stood at the door, her expression somber. Mr. Paul, she began, her voice shaky. I should have told you earlier. Your parents, they, they hid something here something they said was for you when the time was right. She led Mason to a wall, pressing a hidden button. A compartment opened to reveal an intricately designed box. Within the box was an artifact, glowing with an otherworldly light. The same artifact? Mason whispered, more to himself. Yes, Mrs. Bennett confirmed. Your parents said it was your legacy and your burden. Mason's purpose was now clear. He had to protect the artifact and solve the mystery behind Harold's death. Chapter 6 A Resolution in Shadows The soft glow of the artifact illuminated the room. Its energy pulsed in Mason's hands, resonating with a force that felt both ancient and profound. But with the beauty of its luminescence came the weight of its history and its ties to both the Cartwrights and Pauls. 
Over the next few days, Mason immersed himself in understanding the artifact. He delved into ancient texts, consulted with historians, and even traveled to the city library's underground archives. The artifact was not only a symbol of unity between the two families, but was believed to have protective powers. With this newfound knowledge, Mason realized he had two tasks, to uncover Harold's murderer and to mend the rift between the Cartwrights and his family. Suspecting that the murderer might strike again, Mason devised a plan. He leaked information about a supposed gathering at the Paul family manor, a gathering where the artifact would be displayed. The night of the event was shrouded in a misty rain. Mason had positioned undercover officers around the perimeter while he awaited inside, the artifact strategically placed on a pedestal in the center of the room. Hours passed, and just as he began to doubt his plan, a shadow moved by the window. The door creaked open, revealing a hooded figure. As it stepped into the light, Mason recognized the person, Elena Cartwright. You! Mason exclaimed. Expected someone else, detective? She sneered, pulling a knife from her robe. Why, Elena? Why kill your own brother? He wanted to expose our family secret to go public with our shared history with the Pauls, Elena hissed. He thought that by embracing the past, we could ensure a more harmonious future. But I couldn't let that happen. The Cartwright's reputation was at stake. In the heat of the moment, the two grappled. The knife slipped from Elena's hand, glinting menacingly before clattering to the floor. The officers stormed in, detaining her. The next morning's headlines read, Heiress arrested for brother's murder, the end of a dynasty. But for Mason it was just the beginning. He convened a meeting with the remaining Cartwrights and presented the artifact. This is not just a symbol of our family's unity, but a beacon of hope. We must forge ahead, not as adversaries, but as allies. The Cartwrights, shocked by Elena's betrayal and hungry for redemption, agreed. Over time, the two families began collaborative endeavors. Scholarships, community programs, and historical projects were launched in the city under the united banner of Paul Cartwright Initiatives. Mason Paul had not only solved a murder, but healed centuries-old wounds. And while he always stayed away from the spotlight, the city knew who their silent guardian was, a detective who sought not just justice, but harmony. Epilogue in the aftermath of Elena's shocking arrest, the entire city was in an uproar. The Cartwright name was tainted, and whispers of the ancient feud with the Pauls were heard on every street corner. As the newspapers churned out salacious details and speculation, Mason realized that there was more to the story than just the artifact and a murder. Determined to find the root cause, Mason decided to confront Elena in prison. The cold, sterile environment of the interrogation room contrasted starkly with the opulence of the Cartwright mansion. Elena, her elegance undiminished by the prison garb, sat calmly. Detective, she acknowledged, why did you really kill Harold? Mason demanded. Elena's eyes glistened with unshed tears. For power, Mason, not just for the Cartwrights, but for myself. The artifact was not just symbolic. It has real power, power I wanted. Mason frowned. You're talking about the protective abilities? Elena smirked. There's more to it. With certain rituals, its power can be amplified. I wanted that for myself. The weight of her ambition pressed heavily on Mason. So, you plan to use the artifact's power to control the city? She leaned in. Not just the city, Mason. Everything. Mason realized the implications. If what Elena said was true, she had intended to wield significant influence, potentially altering the course of history. The feud, the murders, the animosity between our families, it's all been leading to this, Mason whispered. Elena's smirk faded. Regrettably, Harold's idealism was an obstacle. 
their conversation was interrupted by a guard, informing them that visiting hours were over. But Mason had what he needed. Armed with this new information, Mason approached the remaining Cartwrights, urging them to set aside the past for the city's future. He proposed the formation of a council, composed of members from both families, to ensure that power was wielded responsibly. The proposal was met with skepticism initially. However, the weight of Elena's betrayal and the potential destruction she could have wrought convinced the families of its necessity. Months passed. The council, under the joint leadership of Mason and a Cartwright representative, oversaw significant improvements in the city. Mason ensured that the artifact was securely guarded, its power harnessed for the greater good. As the city flourished under the combined might of the Cartwright and Paul families, old wounds began to heal. The unity that both Harold and Mason had dreamt of was slowly becoming a reality. Mason often visited a memorial built in Harold's honor, a symbol of a bright future born from a tumultuous past. And as the sun set over the sprawling cityscape, Mason knew that while the path to peace had been treacherous, the destination had been worth the journey. The end.